Come on, put your hands together for this trio. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, if you're still standing, let's, let's make a confession of faith. Say it with me. This is the day the Lord has made. I rejoice and I'm glad in it. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives by faith in me. His word dwells in me richly. So I'm able to say, I'm blessed. I'm healed. I'm delivered. I've been set free. Sickness can't dwell in me. The number of my days he will fulfill. Sin cannot dominate me because the seed of God's word lives in me. And I boldly confess Jesus Christ is my Lord. I believe he's risen from the dead. I'm a new creation in Christ. And by faith I have the abundant life. And the victory he provides. Therefore no weapon. Forged against me. Will prosper. I'm more than a conqueror. Because God loves me. Greater is he that is in me. Than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ. He strengthens me. As the redeemed of the Lord, I say so. Come on, say so. Say so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Greater than all my sins. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall my praise begin? You've taken away my burdens, set my spirit free. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaches even me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank God for the fellowship that we have as believers in Christ and uh, the fact that we can stand together uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ against every trick, scheme, or wile of the devil, knowing that we have the victory. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, the questions that are uh, being asked there in the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians where the Apostle Paul said, what fellowship has righteousness with wickedness? Yeah. Or what communion has light with darkness? Or what concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part hath a believer with an infidel? Or what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Well, then Paul says, for we are the temple of the living God. As the Lord has said, I will live in them and dwell in them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Then he exhorts us, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Can you say amen again? Amen. 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 I, um, I've got a word from the Lord for you. And it's, it's really a foundational preparation word 
uh, that will enable you to go into all that God has for you. Uh, there are a lot of folk uh, that uh, that miss the best that God has for them because uh, they have a poor foundation. And uh, laying the groundwork for foundational truth is one of the best decisions that anyone can make. Uh, just in terms of, of physical construction, um, uh, no one builds a house without laying a foundation. Amen. Amen. And um, so this, this whole matter of building upon a solid foundation uh, for truth, uh, it's taught there. Um, where is it in the sermon? The Sermon on the Mount. Um, that we are taught uh, uh, at the end of Matthew chapter 7. Um, and it's not the text I'm going to read, but, uh, but just to, uh, to remind you of um, the apostle, uh, the Lord Jesus said that uh, two men build a house. And at the end of chapter 7, which is the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, he says, therefore, everyone that hears these words of mine and puts them into practice uh, is like a wise person who builds his or her house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Amen. Amen. All kinds of adversities will come against you. Uh, but if you have a solid foundation, your house, which is your life, will withstand every kind of trial, every kind of torment from the enemy, every kind of false accusation. <laughs> I can't even begin to tell you uh, false accusations against against me that have happened uh, in my city. Uh, but but when you have a solid foundation, <laughs> the accusations just fall to the ground. Amen. Um, and uh, praise God for the foundation. And then he says, everyone who hears these words, there are a lot of folk who hear what they need to hear, but they don't put it into practice. And uh, the second group, they, they heard the words of mine, but they did not put them into practice like a foolish man who built a house on sand. Uh, the rain came down, the same wind, rain came down, the same streams rose, the same wind blew and beat against that house and it fell with a great crash. Amen? So the text that I'm about to read to you is so foundational. I'm going to take my time to go through it piece by piece. And uh, if you've got um, a pen and paper, um, by all means, take, take these notes down. It's, it's important to remember. Uh, kind of reminds me of uh, the story of uh, an older couple that was in bed together. And the husband got up to go downstairs. Um, his wife and he were in bed together watching uh, television and and they had the kind of remote control where they could pause whatever they were watching. And uh, he got up and was going downstairs. And when his wife saw him get up, she said, Are you, you're going downstairs? And he said, yes. Uh, she said, well, listen, um, would you, when you come back, would you bring me up? Uh, there's some ice cream, ice cream in the freezer uh, uh, of the refrigerator. And um, she said, uh, and in the cabinet, there's chocolate syrup. Um, and um, I just feel like a Sunday today. So uh, would you uh, uh, dip out some ice cream in a bowl and then put some of that chocolate syrup over the ice cream? He said, you got it, babe. Bowl of ice cream, chocolate syrup. She said, well, now wait. Before you leave, write it down. <laughs> because we know how forgetful you are. He said, babe, I'm not going to forget it. Bowl ice. We've been married for forever. I got you. I got you. Bowl ice cream, chocolate syrup. Bowl ice cream, chocolate syrup. She said, humor me because 
We know how forgetful you are. Write it down. Of course, he didn't write it down, and off he went. And when he came back, he handed her a bologna sandwich. Reluctantly, she took the bologna sandwich from him and looked at it. She said, see, I told you to write it down. You forgot the mustard. <laughs> Come on, tell, tell somebody sitting near you. Write it down because we know how forgetful you are. Uh, okay. Psalm 24. Uh, turn with me if you've got your Bible in front of you. Psalm 24. Um, uh, this is a foundational psalm, especially for those that want to be used of God to establish his kingdom with authority in and through their own lives. Um, the psalmist begins, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, this king of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the king of glory. Pray this simple prayer. Open my eyes that I may see Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that will unlock and set me free. Silently now. That doesn't mean that you can't say amen. But silently now, I wait for thee. Ready, my God. Thy will to see. Open my eyes. Illumine me. Spirit divine. In Jesus name. Amen. This powerful psalm begins with a statement about what's true in all of the world. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all who live in it. There's no one, whether Christian or non-Christian, old or young, black or white, rich or poor, that would really have anything to say negative about that statement. The earth belongs to God and everything that's in it. That's the birds and the bees, the rocks and the hills, the trees, Every animal that's in the field, every fish that's in the sea, the earth is the Lord's. He owns it. He rules over it. Now, you may have a contention with someone who doesn't believe in God and wants to claim atheism, uh, but I heard one preacher say, there are no atheists in a foxhole. Amen. Amen. <laughs> They, they be down there crying out while bullets are flying everywhere and while bombs are exploding everywhere. They be praying, God, if there is a God, save my life if I have a soul. Amen. 
then it's not only the the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it, but then he then focuses on you and me, human beings, the world, the world of mankind and everyone that lives in it. Then he gives the reason for it because he's the, he's the one he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. Kind of reminds you of what the psalmist said. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. So do you didn't make yourself uh, God, even though your parents got together in a procreation fashion, Nothing happens apart from God's say so. Whether you were, whether somebody wanted you to be born or whether they didn't want you to be born, God wanted you to be here. There are no accidents with God. <laughs> Everything that happens was by his own eternal purpose. You are no accident. You're close enough to somebody tell them you're not an accident. Your mama may have wanted a boy and you came out a girl or your, or your daddy may have wanted a boy and you came out a girl, but he, he loves you still the same. Amen. Then he goes on to say, uh, uh, after he's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the water, he asked the question, and it's an important question that all of us must consider. The question is, in terms of having a relationship with God, he asked, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The question really is the question about being, seeing yourself as a spiritual priest. Now, there's a difference between a priest and a prophet. A priest is someone who represents others to God. If you are someone who prays, you're fulfilling the function of a priest. So that if I was, as your pastor I'm sure is doing, praying for you, let's say that in this direction I'm praying and I am including in my prayer those folk that are in my life, on my mind. And so I bring those persons into my prayer life and cry out to God on their behalf. A priest is one who represents others to God. I'm, I'm here as a prophet. I'm here representing God to others. A prophet is one who speaks the word that people desperately need to hear. And a priest is one who prays prayers that God needs for him, the priest, to pray that ministers to the needs of people that he carries in his heart. All of us need to fulfill both functions because when you speak to someone about God, you're fulfilling a prophetic function. And when you speak to God about those someones, you're fulfilling the priesthood profession. Both are important professions in all of us and we all need to function in those professions. Here he asks the question, who qualifies as a priest? Who will ascend the hill of God? Who will stand in the holy place? Of course, he's using Old Testament language. This is one of the Psalms uh, of David. He's recognizing that on Mount Zion, there was the tabernacle. So who ascends the hill of God? He's speaking about a priest. Who stands in the holy place? See, because the priest was one that would go into the holy place on the left side, and I know I'm pointing to my right, but to your left. On the left side is the candelabra. It represents the Lord because it's made out of beaten 
beaten gold with the seven sticks candle. Oh, my God. The seven is the number of perfection that, that represents God Almighty. On the right side is uh, the table of showbread. And on the table of showbread are 12 loaves of bread. 12 is the number of government. Amen. Amen. There are 12 apostles. Amen. I mean, there may be others that had apostolic, but, 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 the, but the Lord called 12. Amen. Amen. 12 is the number of government. The, the city that is four square. Oh, all right. I mean, this is just, this is just, apocalyptic language uh, you know there's no square city <laughs> come on come on but but he's he's speaking so that you that pay attention how many gates are to the city there are 12 gates to the city three on each side three fours of 12 and there are four sides so so there, there so what is he saying when he says there's Three gates to the north, three gates to the south, three gates to the east, three gates to the west. That means it's just another way of saying you can come to Jesus from any kind of lifestyle, from any kind of craziness, from any kind of direction. You're included. Whether you're black or white, rich or poor, male or female. Old or young, amen. You can come. I might include gay or straight. Amen. So, so, so th this matter of a priest who may ascend the hill of God, who may stand in the holy place. See, he's talking about someone who actually goes past the the entrance of the tabernacle. He hasn't gone into the Holy of Holies. That's separated from the first room is where the candelabra is and the table of showbread. Some, some versions have the altar of incense in this room. Some put the altar of incense in the most holy place. But, but it is, it is, the altar of incense is burning always. And, and it's speaking about the prayers of the saints so that I mean, it all represents the kind of walk we are to have. We are to walk in fellowship with God. Uh, the, 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 the bread that's on the table, you know, what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So that not only do you have to have respect and honor and reverence for God, that, that's the, 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 the candelabra, but on, on the other side is the table of showbread where you are to live by his word. It's not just that you honor the Lord, but you walk in obedience to his word. And then if the, if the altar of incense is there in that room as well, <laughs> you're, you're not going to get anywhere without prayer. And prayer needs to be something that is so much a part of your life that it is flowing from you, <laughs> whether you uh, whether you are asleep or whether you are awake. Amen? Amen. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? Who qualifies to be a priest? It's an excellent question, and the psalmist answers his own question. He says, "There are four criteria. Number one, he that has clean hands. Number two, he that has a pure heart. Number three, he who does not lift up his soul to an idol. Number four, or swear by what is false. So there are two positives and two negatives that qualify you. The first is he who has clean hands. Hands kind of reminds me of when I was uh, younger, uh, very young. And I remember 
uh, coming into the house. Uh, we lived in West Philadelphia, and my mother uh, would, would was home. She wasn't always home because there were times that she worked off and on. Uh, my dad was gone, so we're not talking about uh, my dad being the person. I mean, he got up early and and came back late. You know, I I mean, he was the man who, when we came in from school, you had to be careful not to wake him up because if those red eyes came out of that bedroom, you were in trouble. <laughs> but but he was there, and my dad was as faithful as they come. And bless his, bless the Lord for for the kind of father that I had. And, uh, but I remember, I remember my mother would be home and, uh, especially in the summertime when we were out playing in the streets and we would get up early, you know, and get dressed. We, we didn't make our own breakfast. We would go out, maybe grab an apple or grab something like a banana or whatever and run out and eat. But by the time lunchtime came and we had been up since six, seven o'clock that morning, by the time noontime came, we were famished. And my mother would then come and clap her hands. She didn't know how to whistle. I should, whatever, you know. I, if it had been me, I'd have, yeah. I'd, I'd have whistled for everybody. Uh, but my mother would come to the, to the front porch and she would clap her hands. Come, you Thompsons, come, come. And we would stop whatever we were doing and run in. And she said, go wash your hands, go wash your hands. And uh, we would run uh, and turn the water, turn both spigots on. And, you know, we'd just be in there. You, know, you stick your hand under them. And was, you're so hungry. <laughs> and we'd come out. And before she would serve us the sandwiches that she had already made, she'd say, let me see your hands. And when we showed those hands that were underwater but without soap, she said, all right, now go back. And wash your hands, and this time use the soap that stay on the sink. <laughs> there are some things that you are not going to do without clean hands. And it's more than just washing your hands with soap, you need to wash your heart with the blood of Jesus. Amen. He that hath clean hands, number one. And then a pure heart, number two. Meaning that you need, if you're going to ascend the hill of God and stand in a holy place, someone that is able to be used of God to represent others. Now, how are you going to represent others with your hands are dirty? Their hands may be dirty. How are you going to represent others if their hearts are impure and your heart is impure as well? So the Lord requires for you to be in a place where those things that you're praying about for others, you don't need to pray about for yourself. Those things have already been taken care of. And it's so important to recognize the place of worship in prayer because the place of worship is where you're entering his gates with thanksgiving and coming into his courts with praise, where you're being thankful unto him and you're blessing his name. Now, the names of God, let me give you the nine compound covenant names for God. Don't worry about your spelling. Spell it any way you can pronounce it. Amen. The first name is Jehovah Jireh. Amen. Jireh. He's our provider. The second name is Jehovah Sidkenu. He's our righteousness. The third name is Jehovah M. Kadeshim. He's our sanctifier. The fourth name is Jehovah Shalom. He's our peace. The fifth name is Jehovah Nisi. N-I-S-S-I. -S -S -I. He's our banner. Banner of victory that waves over us. What was that? Number five? The sixth name is Jehovah Shammah. He's the God who is there. He promised to never leave you, never to forsake you. 
The seventh name is Jehovah Rohi. He's our shepherd. The eighth name is Jehovah Rapha. He's our healer. And the ninth name is Jehovah Sabaoth. He's our captain. Now, if you enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, if you are, then he repeats it. If, so you are to be thankful unto him and bless his name. In the process of you being thankful unto the Lord in prayer and blessing and praising and magnifying his names, you may hear something from him about your own walk. That's the place where you need to get everything straight. See, uh, you remember the Lord's Prayer? Well, in fact, the title of my book, and I, I brought them up here, uh, these books that you can purchase. But this one, Lord teaches to pray, is from Luke chapter 11, where the disciples were at one point seeing Jesus praying. Evidently, they had been told by Jesus if I'm praying, don't disturb me. Wait until I'm finished. And when he finished praying, the disciples approached him and one said, Lord, teach us to pray. Like John taught his disciples. And Jesus taught them what we know as the Lord's Prayer, but it's unlike the prayer that John the Baptist taught his disciples. And he taught them that you begin your time of prayer. And I recognize that there are times that you're, you're in prayer and you're praying specifically for a need that you're standing in front of. And I recognize that. Especially, I mean, if you're at a hospital visitation or if you're standing with someone that is going through a trial, uh, you may not have all of the time to do the first part of the prayer. Because the first part of the prayer is worship. Come on, say it. Worship. Amen. But if you, if you are up early in the morning and you want to begin your day with prayer, then include every part of it. Start with our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. See, he, it's, it's just like enter your gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. Hallowed be thy name. Amen. It's the time where you lay before God saying, Lord, I'm here. I'm wide open. There may be some things that I have walked past that I didn't recognize, but I want to recognize them now. I want to praise you and magnify your name around all of the different needs that your names, there's no one name that describes all of who he is. He's our provider. He's our healer. He's our captain. He's our deliverer. He's our righteousness. He's, <laughs> you need to recognize I'm walking in a righteousness that has been provided by the Lord. Amen. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in the holy place? He who has clean hands. He who has a pure heart. Someone who's conscious that they're keeping their walk clean, their hands clean, their, their walk clean. Their heart is pure because they have a pure intention of walking in fellowship with God. But then the negative side, he says, those that have not lifted up their soul to an idol. So in other words, those who are not idol worshipers. I'm not bowing down before some statue. I'm not ruled by some pagan ritual. Who may ascend the hill of God? Who may call upon his name? Who may cry out to God Almighty? 
Not someone who's bound by a pagan ritual or some kind of idolatrous practice. But number, but number four, he who does not swear by what is false, he who walks in the integrity of honesty, is not someone who makes a pledge, who promises to tell the truth, but who lies instead. Those are the people that God wants to use. And, and uh, th there's, there's no wiggle room in there. Just, just four areas. Who can't? The Lord just says, look, look, I, I want you to have clean. I want you to be clean. You're going to be ministering to people that are dirty. And if you're dirty, how do you minister to them? <laughs> Come on. Uh, how do you get the beam out of your, how do you get the, the speck of dust out of your brother's eye when you have a popsicle stick sticking out of your own eye? I mean, you got to remove the popsicle stick so you can see clearly to help your brother. You can't help me if you need help. I mean, if I was, if I was walking along with you and I fell into quicksand and I'm sinking, I'm going down and I say, help, help. And you run over and said, I'll help you. I'll be, it, while I'm going, I'll be smacking you, you idiot. How you going to help? You can't help me. Who's going to help thee? In order for you to help a person sinking in quick stand, you got to stand on some solid ground and throw them something. Throw a rope. Throw a vine. Reach a hand out if you can get there. Amen. Is this making sense? Yes. Clean hands, a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul or her soul to an idol, a sworn by that which is false. Then he goes on to say, he will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Hmm. I don't know about you, but I want to be blessed of God. And not only do I want to be blessed of God in the sense that I'm walking right, I'm standing in faith, I'm believing what God has promised. But then in my walk, I may end up being accused falsely. And I may need someone to give witness to who I really am. Uh, so this word vindication, I, I may need somebody to vindicate me. <laughs> I mean, if I'm on trial for my life, it would be really nice if the, if the bailiff would say, now we have a, for the defense, we have a witness for the defense. And the, and the bailiff cries out, um, the witness for the defense is Jesus Christ. Can you just imagine the Lord walking into the courtroom? I mean, like like you've seen in the Bible with the robes and all of that. You know, he he'd walk it in, and he, he the the bailiff says, "You promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth." So up, you God, and the Lord Jesus says, "I do." And then he sits down, and then the lawyer comes up. My lawyer comes up and says. Um, do you know the defendant? I would want the Lord Jesus to say, yes, I know him. When's the last time you talked to him? Well, he's talking to me right now. And I'll be, I'll be right there praying, oh, Jesus, please. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, please. <laughs> Do you understand? The last thing you want is for the Lord to be your witness and your lawyers say, do you know the defendant? Well, not as good as I'd like to. <laughs> See, I want God to be my vindication. I want to know him so well and he to know me so well that he can actually speak for me. He'll be the vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, 
who seek your face, O God of Jacob. I, I want to be, you want to be a part of the generation of those that know the Lord so well for yourself that you are seeking his face. You're not just seeking his hand. There are a whole lot of Christians, and I don't want to say they're not Christians, but they're certainly not the strongest, that all they want is what God can give. But someone who seeks his face is not there by what they can get, but by what they can give. Lord, I'm seeking your face because I want your approval over my life. I want to know that I'm doing what you want me to do. Are, are there benefits that will come? Yes, yes. But whether I seek them or whatever, they will come. There's no way for me to sow a seed of righteousness and not get the benefit from it. But I, I'm not, that's not my reason. I'm, I'm sowing the seeds of righteousness and truth. And I know there's no way for me to put down good seed without getting a good crop. Of course I know that. But there's a difference between doing something just for the sake of something else. And soon as the something else happens, I'm on, Lord, you're on your own. I've taken care of, uh, I got mine. No. Does that make sense? This is the generation of those that seek your face, that seek to please you, that seek to get your approval. And then he ends up by saying, lift up your heads, O ye gates. That word of lift up your heads, O ye gates, is actually a word for you and me. Because when you are someone that recognizes the earth as the Lord's and everything that's in it, the world and all who live in it, where he's founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters, and then you qualify by being someone who is a priest before God. You're representing others in prayer. You have clean hands, a pure heart. You've not lifted up your soul to an idol or sworn by that which is false. You're someone that received the blessings from God and vindication even from God who is your savior. You become such is the generation of those that seek his face. You're someone who is seeking to please God in all of your ways. Then the Lord says to you, all right, now, since you have qualified yourself, he says to you, lift up your heads because now you have qualified to be a gate to what God is doing. Lift up your heads, O oh, you gates. Even lift up ancient doors that the Lord, the King of glory, can step on in. Oh, get that right. You got, see, see, the Lord is looking for the right persons to actually see themselves and qualify themselves to be doorways into the benefit and blessings of God that so many miss. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up the ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is he, the king of glory? Then the answer is given. He's the Lord strong and mighty. He's the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads. Even lift up the ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. Who is he? This king of glory. He's the Lord Almighty. He's the king of glory. And when he is ushered in by godly men and women who are treating the truth 
with respect, who are determined to not only be saved themselves, but to be mature so they can reach out and touch the lives of others. God will use you in a powerful and supernatural way. And he'll use not only what you say, but what you don't say. He'll use the look that's on your face. You'll not only speak as an example, you'll be an example. Because you got clean hands and a pure heart. You've not lifted up your soul to an idol or sworn by what is false. You're walking in a level of integrity. Now, you're not perfect, but you're walking in a level of integrity, a level of character that shines brighter than the noonday sun. There's no way for a person who knows you to miss the truth that flows out of your life. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Thank you for the strength that we receive as we determine to walk by faith and not by sight. As we turn, determine to be the answer that so many seek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In these closing moments, as we, I prepare to leave this pulpit. Turn the service back into the hands of your pastor. If there's a word that you heard has brought you to a place where you're saying, I, I, I see shortcoming in my life. And I want to acknowledge it, even if you're a believer. If you're not a believer, of course you've seen shortcoming because you're not saved. But if you are here and you're saying, I've heard that, that I can do better as someone that God wants to use powerfully. If that's you, our heads are bowed, and eyes are closed. Would you just stand to your feet right where you are? Let's believe God in prayer. Bless you. Bless you. Are there others? Just stand right where you are. Let's believe God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Are there others that will grab the coin? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Are there others that will join these? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to, as we close, I want to invite all of you to pray the same prayer that I'm going to lead these that are standing into praying. And uh, because I want them to pray aloud, I want you to pray aloud as well. Pray this prayer with me. Father, come on. Yeah, you can keep the music going. Pray with me. Father, as I am here today, I believe I've heard this word from Psalm 24. Not by accident, but by your design. I'm saying yes to you. Yes to the Lordship of Christ over my life. Yes to my faith. For I believe that Jesus is risen from the grave. I say yes to the gospel. Yes to the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Father, teach me to be a prayer warrior. One that can stand against the enemy and gain the victory. Use me as never before. As I grow in grace, 
and in the knowledge of Christ to be used by you to turn multitudes from darkness to light. In faith, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, clap your hands and praise God.